Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Goldstein. I'm an academic uh, at the University of Bristol. Uh, I teach physics and also I do research on the CMS experiment at CERN, uh, which is what we're going to have a virtual uh, tour of today. Uh, I know we're still sorting out problems with the chat. Hopefully uh, you'll be able to uh, ask questions. If you can't ask individually, then you can ask for your teacher. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please ask uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, I will relay them to the team at CERN who are going to do the tour uh, and uh, then uh, we can answer to go along or maybe we'll answer some of them in the chat as we go along as well. So um, I'm going to hand over now to the team, uh, the first team who are sitting in the control room uh, at CMS uh, and they can uh, tell you more about where they are and who they are. So over to you, maybe Sarah. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sarah. I'm a postdoc uh, working uh, at the University of Bristol with Joel. I work on, oh, there, there you go. Hopefully you can hear me. Just a quick wave, I'm gonna put the mask back up. Uh, so I am uh, an applied physicist. I work on the uh, next generation of silicon detector that will be installed in CMS when the LHC uh, is upgraded to the high luminosity LHC in about uh, seven years from now, seven, eight years from now. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Uh, and here in the control room as well, we've got uh, three other uh, CMS colleagues who will introduce themselves. So um, I hand over to them. Hello, my name is Andro Machi. I am a physicist also, just like Sarah. I am a little bit special, closer to electrical engineering by years of experience. Uh, I work at CERN since uh, the 90s, the early 90s, and I will be taking you down together with Noemi on a tour close to the detector. My interests are mostly on electrical and electronics engineering and uh, Please feel free to ask uh, any questions. Uh, we have to really tell you that uh, you cannot ask any stupid question here. It's everything is rather complicated. So please be our guests. And now it's my colleague. Hi, my name is Noemi. Um, I'm also a physicist. Uh, I work for the CMS detector since 2004. As a student, I started here. and. Today, I'm here to help with the virtual visit, basically, just with my colleague Dalton, who is I will just, just turn to myself. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm Zoltan. Um, well, I'm going to be behind the camera today, so I'm probably more or less not seen, uh, very rarely heard. Uh, I'm in, 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 in my civilian life, I work for the gem detector. Uh, and also, my profile is is closer to Maki, uh, as I'm I'm uh, uh, a lover of electronics and 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 also some software engineering. Uh, though I'm 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 also a physicist, just like her. <laughs> so so actually, we have a, a very common uh, uh, profile. Um, right, that's all. I'm going to go silent and give back the the camera to the correct position. <laughs> so uh, I guess I think we can start to move down. Yes, yeah. we will move down. Yeah. So, and uh, and so we let you enjoy yeah. yourselves. So and we can show the control. Exactly. So Andrew Mahe and Naomi are gonna make their way down to uh, the main experimental cavern where you can have a good look around CMS. Uh, but first, before they get in the elevator and make their way uh joel how many meters <laughs> below yeah so it's about so the control room where sarah currently is is on the surface so you can get some daylight the nice windows and you can go outside for a yeah. breath of fresh air yeah. as you can see it's very high tech um it looks a bit like well uh a bit like a you'd expect a control room maybe for a secret scientific mission to look like uh, so you can see that there. That's on the surface. The actual experiment is about 100 meters underground, um, almost directly below uh, where, yeah. where they're standing at the moment. Yeah. You can see on this uh, sort of, uh, graphic on the top left, 
the, the LHC, which is a ring, is about 27 kilometers in total length. Uh, and at four points, there are shafts going down with an experiment at the bottom. So the LHC, uh, as you may have learned, accelerates protons round and accelerates them to very high energies in, the, in two opposite directions uh, around that ring. Uh, and then it smashes them into each other at those four points. And at each of those four points, we surround the uh, the accelerator, which around the collision point, by extremely uh, complex uh, electronics. It basically functions like a huge uh, digital camera. Um, and you can see the pictures of the uh, four experiments there. The one we all work on and the one you're seeing today is CMS, which is the one in the top right corner, which, of course, uh, is naturally the best uh, experiment uh, of the four. Um, and That's maybe we can just... to look at. Yes. <laughs> Um, right, so the, the place that Mackie and uh, the others are going down uh, underground, you can see the plan of it now in the uh, top left. Um, so you can see it's quite complicated underground. Um, uh, there are actually two caverns uh, down at the bottom of the lift shaft, uh, which they're heading towards now. Um, the accelerator runs right through the middle. Uh, and there's one big cavern that holds the experiment, and then there's a smaller cavern next to it, which is where we'll start, uh, which holds all of the electronics and computers and uh, other equipment uh, that are needed to operate the detector uh, and take the data. Quite interesting. We need to put, so from, uh, from my point of view, it's quite interesting that all this stuff has to live close enough to the experiment to be, you know, um, to make certain things a bit easier, like be able to transmit information this, yeah, to that, to the off detector electronics has to be close enough that you can use certain means of transmission, et cetera. But on the other hand, it can't live in the cavern itself because as you will find out when you go down, there are certain environmental conditions in the cavern that make operating standard electronics quite difficult. So we have the high magnetic fields, we have uh, a very intense radiation environment. So having these two caverns side by side, but accessible and close by is, is, is quite useful. We should also point out that um, one of the reasons why it looks kind of quiet in the control room uh, at the moment, um, a few people around, but not too many, uh, and also why we're actually allowed to go underground and go right into the detector hall um, is because at the moment uh, it's the winter time. In the winter time, the LHC is normally shut down for maintenance and upgrades. So it won't be actually, we won't actually be running the machine and colliding protons uh, for uh, another couple of months. Yeah. So we're taking advantage of that to actually take you down. So you can see now, you can follow Maki uh, as she goes heading off towards the elevator. There's a, she's just passing a model of CMS. Uh, and now this is, the bit where we have to carefully control who's allowed uh, underground. You can't just wander down and she's going through the access. It's going to be quite funny watching Zoltan go through. I've never seen this done uh, from the point of view of a video camera before. No. And actually one of the few things, if you ever see the, the movie Angels and Demons, which is supposed to be about certain, probably the only thing it gets right is that you have to have your retina scanned. So that's what Mac is doing at the moment. Uh, she's actually uh, trying to get the scanner to recognize her, her iris. And it has. Well done. Right. I, I, don't, just, know I, have just learned, I don't know how that's going to work. With comment. Yeah, I have just one comment, if I may. Yeah. Um, in the film, in the movie, you remember probably how it happened. Uh, probably I, it's better if I don't recall. But what I want to, to, to re, uh, tell now that this is, this reader, is the third generation since the movie was shot. And this now uh, looks for the blood circulation as well and checks both eyes. Just in case. <laughs> Just in case. Okay. Just in case anyone has. Uh... Yeah, so, so for those of you who haven't seen the movie, uh, you probably won't understand the reference there, but we're really not going to explain it because it's quite revolting. Um, <laughs> anyway, so now at the top of the lift shaft, um, so oh, it's never at the top when you want it, is it? No, that is consistent. It's amazing, isn't it? Wherever you go, even 
down to CMS, you have to wait for the elevator. But while we're waiting for the elevator doors to open, uh, maybe what we can do is, uh, rather than give you no spoilers, so instead, maybe we have a, a look at where we're sitting in the control room. No, they are already, they're already the there. Elevator. They're in the so. elevator, but watching the elevator go minus one. Yeah. All right, yes. So you can okay, see. Okay, maybe that we the, can take them down. Yeah, the elevator, you can see. First of all, the amazing thing is we actually have good reception in the elevator because yes. uh, we run uh, both. Only on way down. On way up, yes, we we, we do have. <laughs> oh, the other <laughs> elevator, yeah. So, okay. um, so okay. now you can see the depth there. That the the elevator actually reads out where how deep underground it is. You can see we're ninety seven meters oh. underground at level minus three. So those. Um, yeah. Oops, we don't have sound from Joel. Oh, oh no, I, I just no. stopped talking. Okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I thought you were about to get out of the elevator, but uh, um, no, going back I up. think in the meantime, probably we could show this and uh, discuss okay. about the. Yeah, but they've changed their the mind. The itself. And they've gone back up, or yeah. yeah no, no, they are just waiting for the elevator to 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 arrive on on the surface to take okay. it. Okay, so Sarah, you have the control of the mouse, so I think you should uh, show the CMS diagram. Okay, so uh, they are. So where are they going first, Sultan? Are they they, going will, they will go to, to minus two first, but uh, uh, I think in the meantime, let's just just show the detector how it looks like. Okay. You don't forget that we are going to lose the reception at some point. Uh, at some point, okay. pretty soon. So take okay. your time. So as Joel said, uh, the okay, CMS is one of the four detectors, cameras, experiments that uh, that sit at the four uh, interaction points uh, around the LHC. I said that CMS is the nicest to look at because um, when you when you when you go down and 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 you have a you have a chance to actually look up at it, it's actually um, aesthetically quite pleasing with all the different colors and all the different <laughs> all the different layers. Uh, but okay, all different colors and all the different layers are also a purpose. So uh, CMS is a an experiment which covers uh, a full four. It's got full four pi coverage of what happens at uh, the interaction point of the two bunches of pro the two pro proton bunches that are colliding. Um, it's um, a detector that is kind of um, like the other like the other four detectors that are. Uh, at the LHC, they are uh, made up of uh, many, many layers. So uh, each layer is like, think of it as an onion, and every layer of the onion gives you a little bit of more information, helps you piece together what's actually happening when the two protons collide. So I work on, uh, if I start from the inside of the onion out, I, uh, my, well, I work on not this specific tracker that's what's called the silicon tracker but what will replace this tracker when uh, uh in a few years time so that's a, a detector that's made out of silicon we call it a tracker because it helps us track uh where the particles have come from uh it helps us reconstruct a kind of a very complicated part of um what the what particle physicists use to make interesting measurements at experiments like CMS. It's an incredibly it, it's an interesting detector because it covers a very large area. It's about uh, I think at the moment it's 170 square meters of silicon. 100 square meters? I can't remember. It's a lot of silicon. It's a so lot. Just, of silicon. To, yep. just to interrupt up uh, interrupt for a second, you can oh, now see that our, our our camera unit is going through one of the rooms full of electronics oh. uh, and that's the electronics that uh, sends control signals into the detector uh, and then receives the data uh, as it comes back so you know, kilometers and kilometers of cabling fiber optics electrical cables power cables uh, you can see it's like a real spaghetti junction in there that all has to be carefully checked uh, you know, there are thousands and thousands of connections uh, and if only one of them is wrong, then we're going to lose a little bit of data. Um, so they're now in the cavern and they're not in the experimental cavern yet. They're in the adjacent cavern. We can still, even when the accelerator is running, you can still get into this 
this cavern just to come down and uh, to uh, you know, fix your electronics or test it and so on. And you can imagine the fun some people have. So we're sitting in the control room. So where we're physically sitting is uh, the trigger shifters uh, spot. So trigger is, uh, okay, I can tell you a little bit more about it later, but it's something that we use to identify which if, which of the collisions that happen. So the collisions happen uh, once every 25 nanoseconds, but uh, we don't necessarily want to look at all the information that comes out of these collisions. We only want to look at interesting events. So we do this with a trigger system. Uh, we're sitting in the trigger shifters desk where uh, a, usually a physicist, uh, students uh, or postdocs or even academics will sit here and monitor the health of the trigger system. And uh, you can, you know, I've heard stories of colleagues who were down in the experimental cavern trying to debug why some of the trigger system wasn't working and they're doing checks like, is this fiber really connected to the right channel? We can imagine trying to dig out that one fiber and find out where it is. Okay, uh, they're still- yep, they are May I ask a quick question? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, has it ever happened before that a connection was incorrect, that you lost some data? All the time. <laughs> uh, especially when people have done maintenance. Uh, when if people have gone in and, and put something new in or fixed something, uh, then the chances are something will be wrongly connected and then you have to check it all when it comes back up and go back down and replace it. Um, so, yeah, it happens frequently. Oh, right. We're now in. We're now in the underground right. gas room. Right. So th this is the uh, this is the gas room. So various bits of the detector need uh, carefully controlled gases for operation, and we can discuss that more later if you want. Uh, often to detect the particles, uh, and this is the room underground, they're, they're stored. So the, most of the gas is stored above ground where it's safer. But we have this room where Maki is now, uh, where there's uh, the, the gases are brought down underground and they're mixed and then sent into the detector. Just to make you understand how complex is our environment and how we absolutely need people of all disciplines, the detector, the center of the detector, what Sarah is working on and what we have been working on is maintained at around more minus 40 degrees of temperature. Now, if you've got sensitive electronics, tiny little connections hanging from each other, you have to be sure that when you are cooling a detector at minus 40, you do not have more than three molecules of water. So the majority of this room here is making sure that everything inside our detector is very dry in a very safe way. However, we have millions and millions of channels and we are fighting every time for distances of millimeters. So this makes drying the environment something as complicated as what you see. Hey. Quite interesting, isn't it? A lot of things I have to come together to make to show you something. Yeah, you know, to take data with an expert, a detector this big. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Joel, do you want to carry on? So there are three. Yeah. So, I, so I was going to say, uh, relating to the gas room, I've spent many a happy hour down there. Uh, you know, even though I'm a, an academic and I'm, you know, you know supposedly a senior person, uh, I still spend a lot of time just doing plumbing. Uh, in that room uh, and making sure that the, the dry airlines that Mackie would talk about uh, go through and, and work and hold pressure and things like that. Right, we're now, so that door that you'll see there goes into the LHC tunnel itself. Uh, we're not allowed to go down that one, uh, but uh, we're now going to head down. Oh, you, you can kind of see the, you're going to go to the pictures, Zoltan? Uh, of um, this, I guess. The picture of the tunnel. No, I was going to show the picture of the tunnel. So they... Oh, we can just go back here. There we go. Well, yes. Oh, but there's there's a life size picture of the LHC tunnel uh, on the wall there that was also just. Uh, oh, maybe Naomi can go over. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. That's Naomi. Naomi can go over. Oh, no, she... oh, so, yeah. oh sorry. Can we go over to the picture of oh, a tunnel? No, yeah. 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 There you go. So, so that if you could go, board. if if you could go through that big red door, this is what you'd see, uh, and that's all uh, life size. 
that's actually only really there as a photo opportunity for if you if you ever visit CMS uh, in person, you can go and stand in front of that and pretend you've been in the LHC tunnel itself. Uh, but access is very restricted there uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I'll tell you that people who have access to the other side of that wall of a tunnel, they kind of wish that they could access the door to the CMS side and have a look on the CMS side mm -hmm. as well. Because, uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> But now, ha having got down un uh, underground using a, a retina scanner, there's now an extra layer of security, and we need special permission uh, to go through uh, uh, to go through this door, which leads into the access tunnel, or will take us into the experiment itself, into the camera of the experiment. Uh, so I can see we just had a question, which is, how many people does it take to run the CMS experiment? That's an excellent question. Um, the answer is it depends on exactly what you mean by run, but every scientific paper that we publish, uh, so uh, every time we publish a result, a new physical result, for example, the Higgs discovery or a new measurement of the Higgs or a new measurement of the W and Z bosons or these other things, in recognition of the work we all do, every one of those publications has 3,000 authors on it. So that's 3,000 people roughly signing every paper. Plus, Plus, there are technicians and engineers and admin people uh, and so on who don't get to sign the papers. So the whole operation is many thousands of people. Uh, in terms of the other way of interpreting the question is how many people does it take to actually keep it running 24 hours a day? We need a shift of about four people 24 hours a day with a, a few dozen other people on call. Right. We're now in the cavern. So let's, um, let's, let's actually stop and look at the... Yeah. Um, Naomi, can we might... just come back a bit? Naomi, do you mind just coming back a bit up the balcony? Uh, yeah. So we're now looking at the heart of the CMS detector. Um, oh. the, the bit on your right at the moment, which is actually the bit that is most frequently shown in, in cartoon depictions. Those of you, uh, unfortunately, you're not on the chat. I would have asked at this point, who has seen the film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse? Uh, because the CMS detector actually features as quite heavily in the plot of that, but you mainly see the right hand bit, uh, and that bit is called the end cap. And when we run, that actually moves in to, as you're looking at the left, and you can see how the, it's got a plug that fits into the hole. Um, and you're not really getting a sense of scale there, but what you're looking at in total is about 15, 15 meters high. Uh, there was a person down the bottom. I mean, can we? Uh, we pan down to the floor. You know what I mean? Is there, is there, is there anyone in shot? But you oh, get yeah. there is Andromeda. So you get you get a sort of sense scale. This thing is absolutely huge. This thing is is yeah. probably the size of your of one of the buildings at your school. You know, it's bigger than a house. It's four 15, story building. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's fifteen meters high. Uh, it's about twenty meters long, um, and it weighs fourteen thousand tons which is, and it has twice as much steel as the Eiffel Tower. And the collisions actually happen towards the left of where we're looking in, in, from the camera shot. So there's kind of a yellow scaffolding frame, which, which we take out before we uh, close up the detector. That's just to help us access different bits. But a few meters, if you're where you see that yellow scaffolding frame, if you go a few meters to the left of that, uh, that's actually where the interactions happen, right in the heart that detector that's where the protons smash into each other uh, and the the protons have so much energy uh you know remember a proton it, it's a hydrogen nucleus it, it's something that's absolutely impossibly tiny to imagine but they have when they collide they have about the same amount mm -hmm. of energy what each. are you talking about about how the protons are circulating yeah. so 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 they have a, yeah, yeah something yeah. like this yeah so, so i follow you so each proton has about the same energy as the kinetic energy of a fly. So that's not a lot of energy, you know, on the scale of things. But it's it's for a subatomic particle to have that much kinetic energy is absolutely huge. And the oh. beams. Yep. How essential is like all of that structure for the experiment to run properly and one effectively? All of it. Uh, or everything you can see. Well, every part of that detector, everything you can see there is a part of the detector and every bit has its own special purpose. So the bits you can see, the big red things you can see both on the 
uh, on the main part of the detector and on the, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you want this one? Cool. This one's easier. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so you can see here, here's a nice one. You can see how uh, the different parts of the detector operate together to give you all the information you need. So mm -hmm. starting on the left of that cutaway, uh, you can see there's that's where the collisions actually happen. Then you can see the different particles travel different lengths through the detector and each different bit of the detector uh, gives you more information about what's going on. So you need everything to piece it together to, uh, to, uh, to, to figure out what the physics was and what's going on. So, so if a tiny bit breaks, you are in trouble? No. Um, if a tiny bit breaks, you've lost something. You, you probably, yeah, hopefully you can recover. Hopefully it's not going to be. So we got a nice, nice look down. So uh, we're now looking at the main part of the detector. You can see the outside bit which was actually colored red in real life and on the diagram, that's then mainly to detect subatomic particles called muons, uh, which are very penetrating. And they're the only ones that sort of make it all the way through and you register a hit all the way through. Most other particles you might've heard of like electrons and photons and protons uh, and maybe pions and kaons, they get stopped early on uh, where you can see the green and yellow bits of the detector. Uh, and now we, we've moved to the other end there. You can see the other end piece, what we call the end cap. Uh, and that, again, you can see the sort of the plug shape that fits into the hole uh, into the center. And I can't quite see on my video, but it looks like the beam pipe is still in place. Yeah, it's yeah. a short shutdown. So. Yeah, there you go. You can see the, yeah, you can see the beam pipe. So that tiny little tube you can see in the center of your picture now, that tiny little tube is the vacuum pipe, which the protons actually travel in. We've had a question from the students. How many proton collisions happen inside the collider? Very good question. Uh, so the collider is set up when it's normally running to collide uh, 40 million times a second. So there are 40 megahertz or every 25 nanoseconds, a go. bunch of protons passes another bunch of protons. And a single bunch passing another bunch is what that picture now shows. And you can have up to about 100 individual collisions in one pass. So you get that much going on 40 million times a second. And it's our job. So, so, so one of the, the very difficult things that, that we have to do as an experiment is, so this picture is after we've connected all these dots together. So you can see the straight lines, but you can, you can see the lines. But you can imagine if I if I'd shown you a picture like this where I, there were no lines drawn through the points, but we just had the little dots that represent the information you get from the individual channels in, um, in, in the tracker, for example, uh, I think you wouldn't be able to look at this by eye and say, okay, these are how all the lines can, this is how, this is what I would do to, 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 to recreate the picture like this. And so one of the challenges that we have is, is to make detectors that can, uh, provide the information in a reliable way like this and to kind of follow up on the question which was asked earlier about what happens if a channel breaks we have to design redundancy into the system so that if one channel breaks we can still complete this picture without missing information so we we wouldn't have you know, part of our job is to make sure there's redundancy there uh, the other part of our job is to make sure that when we do build pictures like this that we match that the what we do is actually um is a representation of what's actually physically happening. And we have various ways of checking this. And one of the things that we do is we are able to simulate what happens when these, when the protons collide every 25 nanoseconds to make 40 million collisions a second. And one of the things that we try and understand as physicists is how well our measurements uh, match with these simulations. Yep. So yep. it's so, quite- uh, so just, just as you're watching the feed from underground, just really look at all of the connections. You've got the huge, so the huge silver pipes of the ventilation, they're probably the least interesting bit. But then you've got all these racks of electronics. This is all equipment that has to be right next to the detector. Uh, and now you can see where we're even closer. We're getting a nice view. You can see the beam pipe coming out. Uh, oh, actually oh. that's two, two, of the, uh, uh, two of the, the two of the end station. There's a, uh, perhaps it's been a while since I've seen that. So that, that's a gap between two of the uh, pieces of the end cap. And you can see the beam pipe running through the middle of it. Joel? Yes. What are what are the people doing there? So there are uh, generally people around doing a little bit of maintenance, maybe replacing electronics that isn't working, yeah. checking things. I can I can tell it in more in details in the previous gap. 
uh, what we've just seen between the two end cap parts. Uh, if Maki can direct Noemi back there, there are some preparation works for the so-called LS3, which will happen in three years from now. Uh, um, and then we have to we have to upgrade a little bit the detector cooling on the RPC detectors and also on the new gem detectors that are going to be installed there uh, uh, next year. Um, so these are just some maintenance works, as Joel said. Yeah, uh, but these are very important them. ones. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. there are no. So I guess say there are no major upgrades going on now. As Alton said, they're going to be the upgrades in a few years' time. That. Uh, but yeah, for yeah. example, in 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 a, in a couple of years, we are going to change this uh, almost whole nose that you are, you see <laughs> yeah. on the picture. Uh, we will we will install a completely new hadron and electromagnetic calorimeter, so uh, called high granularity calorimeter. This is one of the flagship projects yeah. of of uh, CMS now. Yeah, it replaces this. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> um, that will that will allow us to 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 get more in details the the uh, the particle energy measurement. So a calorimeter, what it does is, as the name suggests, it kind of tries to measure the energy of the particle. So as Joel was saying earlier, each layer of detector provides you more information. So the tracker gives you position, uh, curvature, uh, then the calorimeters give you energy. Uh, you have two different types of calorimeters because you, drop, because you need to the, the way it's kind of I find it interesting that the way that you try and identify the energy of a particle is you see when it stops and how it stops and what it produces when it stops. So the electromagnetic calorimeter, yeah, go ahead, Joel. No, no, I was just going to say you can now see that we're at the uh, the cameras now at the at the floor level. Uh, <laughs> do you want to point out what you're pointing at? Mahi, what are you? Uh, uh, Mahi, what are you? You're pointing I am pointing. Uh, Mahi is pointing out a little yeah, bit. Will yeah, we... help us move the detector <laughs> because you know all this. You can think of our detector as a salami that you can cut in several slices, but each slide can, slice can weigh up to two thousand tons. So unfortunately, Maki was more, yeah. more, more. Yeah. Okay. So, so sorry, Maki. Four thousand. How much is it? Yeah, something like uh, uh, one thousand, between one thousand and two thousand. Well, actually, yes. I'm just just let me just tell you what tell tell what you said why you were dropped out for a for a second. So yeah. these are air cushion uh, 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 lifters, and we can we can raise up the uh, the detector parts uh, to a tiny little millimeter or so uh, on the air air cushion, and then we can tow them with a very simple towing machine, Maki is going to show it, so something <coughs> ridiculously small <laughs> uh, with respect to these uh, thousand tons objects. Sorry, sorry for interrupting you, Maki. Go ahead. No, it's all right. I just wanted them to understand uh, the complexity, the engineering necessary, and how the whole thing works by putting, opening the detector doing what we have to do and then closing back it's not as simple as it sounds but it is doable yep. putting it back exactly how it was before we put it we pulled it apart as well yeah and also what you don't know is there is a level under the detector where really lots of piping uh, gas uh, cabling happens so there is also floor minus one must have been quite amazing to watch these to watch it being put together uh, I know, Joel, were you, were you, did you yeah, see any I, of the pieces go down the cavern the first time around? I watched, so the, the largest piece that weighs about 2,000 tons uh, mm -hmm. went down, it was lowered down at the 100 meters underground in one go. Oh, I think they're, they're trying to demonstrate now that... Oh, we still have some... Yeah, the remnant field. field. Um, yeah. So so the magnet is now off, but of course there is some remnant field in the the... the Iron, iron slabs around. Of course, we are cheating a little bit. The the magnetic field uh, is stronger at the edges, so they are they are trying to exploit this uh, uh, thing. But actually, you can see that that there is some remnant field. Um, just I just would like to remind that we can have virtual visits in those very special cases when the magnet is on, but there is no beam in the machine. 
uh, then we can demonstrate the magnetic field not only with uh, these uh, tiny little paper clips, but uh, but a real spanner uh, tethered uh, to the uh, to the guide, of course. Otherwise, it would fly. That that is very very spectacular. Um, just quickly, just a quick update from our side. Uh, Joel, I don't know if you want to prompt a few different questions. We have about 10 minutes left of our side of the chat. So, yeah, please uh, ask away if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, we're quite happy to keep talking as we show you around. So you can see actually some of the more mundane things like the uh, the, the, the hoist on the left, uh -huh. which enables us to access. Yeah, the, this machine is so big, we, need, we basically have to treat it like a construction site, uh, which is why people are wearing hard hats. And why we have this kind of construction machinery to enable us to access bits of the detector um, from the ground level. Almost all of us, all of us have a, a driving license on them, by the way. Um, That'd be good if I get one of those and not on an actual car. Yeah. <laughs> a, a little bit more complicated than a car yeah. since it is three dimensional oh, yeah. movement. But <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things that I have to like think about uh, is or at least understand is eventually when when we want to install the new detector oh yeah so they're just they're just pointing oh. out the, the the level minus three down below oh, the yeah I, I wouldn't i wouldn't send them down there because there is no wi-fi network there <laughs> yeah yeah okay just point. well excuse so me the things you have to think about is well when you take it you're gonna have to kind of take this apart in some way and then install things again and put them again piece by piece and like you know you have to worry about who goes first do I install so the, does the pixel go in before the pixel is a special one? Are um, you exposed to any radiation while you're down there? Um, not too much. Not too much. Not too much. Actually, actually, all of our people who are down there, including our uh, precious guides, must be a, a, a dosimeter, a personal dosimeter down there. So we are we are continuously monitored, and those people who go close to the beam pipe, probably in that that yellow cage over there. They must take uh, an active dosimeter that we carried out uh, continuously, uh, totally, and we, we completely uh, record the dose. Yeah. Of course, the uh, our precious colleagues are not guinea pigs, yeah. so we have uh, different means as well to to read the, the yeah. doses, and that's what we used to do before we allow people going there. Uh, we should be absolutely sure that uh, this uh, working environment is is harmless. Yeah. To people. Okay, so we just had another question from Shay. How do large piece of machinery get 100 meters under the ground? Um, the answer is there's a huge lift shaft uh, that you kind of we, we've kind of gone past it on the video a couple of times. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a, a giant hole. I'm not I can't remember oh. exactly what diameter it is, but it's actually just 20 meters, 18, so 20 meters, 18 okay. or 20 meters, something like. So so this is just a little bit bigger than the diameter of the detector, something like 10 centimeters bigger. <laughs> That's not a lot bigger. <laughs> we had to fit it. Well, actually, uh, you, either you believe or not, the most expensive in this, this project is the civil engineering. So uh, we couldn't afford getting a one meter diameter more uh, or bigger shaft, because that would blow up the, 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 the coasts. So we had to make sure uh, uh, that that we can lower our detector and that's it. So we had to keep the 10, 10 centimeter clearance from the walls. What's well, super interesting is all like... Sorry, we're getting a bit of feedback on the live stream. It's a bit hard to follow. I'm not sure where um, the sound is echoing. Um, Sounds okay to me. Are we still... Is that better or are you still getting a little actually, bit of feedback? Yeah, actually, if I listen into the... The live stream sound, it, it sounds fine. Okay. Well, okay. Anyway, you are going to get a recorded version as well. So this is just a technical information for the for the viewers. We record everything and going to republish it on YouTube. <laughs> okay, and they're making their way back out again. Yep. So, yep. Yep. And uh, yeah. they a different the, access the, tunnel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. This is the the my level minus three where yeah. they are. Uh, everything has a code name. This is uh, UP55. If we can well, show whether it shows anything. So, so, that's, so they are, they are at this moment are getting through. Oh, sorry. I have to show it. Yeah. Um, so they are, uh, yeah, I have to 
to put it on a switcher. So they are leaving through this little tiny little gallery through to the so-called PM54 shaft where the elevator runs them back up to surface. Uh, previously, they were here in this cavern, as we call it, UXC Underground Experimental Cavern. So actually, there are, there are some meaning of the abbreviations. Um, and and uh, they were here, they, they landed or landed, if I can use this phrase at all. So when they went down, they first got into this underground uh, uh, cavity called USC, Underground Service Cavern. They walked a little bit and through this underground uh, uh, gallery, they went around the, the iron concrete pillar, something more than seven meters thick, and they got into the experimental cavern. This pillar is needed there just in order to, to, to keep the, the rocks falling in uh, uh, into these huge cavities. So this is, this is rather a mechanical structure, but that we use for a radiation shield as well. So that allows us to visit the service cavern every time regardless that if there is beam in this the, the experimental cavern or not we can even take visitors there yeah, and they're back at the elevator yeah they are now back in the elevator well elevator. actually uh yeah different elevator for some reason no that's no, the same just, that's no, the same elevator the uh, for some reason it goes down but very probably they are just waiting in front okay. of the elevator to arrive okay. yeah. um yeah, yeah. joel yeah, I was going to just say it's the last few minutes, so if you have any questions, uh, now's the time to ask them. Although, although of course, you can, uh, if you think of questions afterwards, you can uh, uh, post them onto the, uh, post them into the the, the, the questions on the uh, the CERN uh, forum uh, on I'm a Scientist, assuming you can get the chat working. Uh, yeah, so... There's some discussion going on in the chat about lowering all the stuff down here. 14,000 tons did require a lot of goes in the lift. The largest single piece was about 2,000 tons. That was the the, the, uh, the mechanical piece of the central detector. And that, that was the piece that, as Alden was saying, only has about 10 centimeter clearance. So everyone's hearts were in their mouths as uh, they were watching that go down over the course of a, a few hours. Um, but yes, the, the lifts, and we had to get special cranes in. Should point out that the the main crane at CMS is not big enough to lift 2,000. Uh, it can only lift a couple of hundred tons. So we had to get a special crane in. I believe it was a shipbuilding crane came in from Hamburg. Uh, but uh, yep, and now going back in the lift. Uh, yep. And just in case you're wondering, the wood paneling around the lift is not for aesthetic reasons. That's just because uh, often heavy equipment is pushed in and out of the lift. Uh, and it's uh, it's basically a, a bumper. <laughs> but we remove all these uh, these linings when we get a real big VIP guests. Oh, I didn't <laughs> know that. So actually, actually, this crane. Back to this crane. This crane is is so special that there are not too many existing on this globe. Something like an you know, order of ten. And when we when we rented this. To, to bring down all our big equipment, heavy equipment underground, we had to keep it in mind that within two years, we have to allow this crane to move to the next station, which was the, the uh, Soccer World Cup uh, stadium building in South Africa. So that, that was actually that time when, when it was built. So we, we had to be uh, very much on, on schedule. Otherwise, we would get the wrath of the, the, the soccer uh, supporters. Gary Prospect. Yep. Oh, wow. right. Actually, we, we also like soccer, so. Uh, yeah, indeed. so that was good. So <laughs> everyone was watching together. Yeah. <laughs> Collaborative as he. All right. Yeah. And then they're almost back, I think. Yes, exactly. They are just a couple of yeah. meters away from us. They just they are just leaving yeah. the, the vertical shaft uh, back on surface. And, past the and, very and nice behind that, that the... gray door, yeah. actually, uh, another door. Behind that, that we are. So yeah. indeed, um, yeah. yeah. Now I'm is just waiting for Maki to, to get get through. Yeah. By the way, colors. Uh, yes. Let me just remind you that the the this pad that Maki just passed is green, and the the pad Maki uh, used to enter the the experimental cavern was yellow. 
actually color really does a meaning does have a meaning uh, the green means that, that this is a not so called interlocked door mm -hmm. why the yellow and especially the red ones are interlocked that interlock means that if there is beam in the machine in the the lhc Seven. and you oh. happen to break through these doors now you are seeing you the beam inside the detector interlock oh yes uh, so if if you break through these doors, you would immediately and automatically shut down shut the 27 the kilometer ring. Yeah. Uh, that's that's also a, a safety measure. Yeah. Of yeah. course, uh, we have cameras everywhere and yeah. record everything. So if you would do it just for fun, uh, you would immediately be asked, why, why are you doing this uh, bad jokes? And we have um, similar interlocks on the, kind of, if you think about it, on the detectors with the, with the, with the beam, what do they call it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so. Uh, oh, right. So behind that wide door, we are. And this is where we are. Then they come and join us again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think we'll see them coming into view behind uh, Sarah's old dad any second. Any second. Yes, I oh. think I just removed the oh. camera image. Yeah, so then we don't get double. And they are going just to show up behind us. There yes. they are. There they are. There. Yep. Thank you so much, Mimi. That was, yeah, thank you very much, Mackie and Naomi. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that was, that was really nice. It was really nice to see it. it it's amazing. Like, it's so breathtaking every time. Believe it or not, yes, every time is just like you've never seen it. Yeah. <laughs> so, do we have. So, we just had, uh, if we got time, I'll answer the question that's just been posted. Uh, does, does the CMS detector detect antimatter? Uh, how do you detect things like antimatter? Yes, the answer is you do, we do detect antimatter. We create it in the collisions all the time. Certainly anti-protons, anti-electrons fly out from the collisions. And the way you can tell, for example, if you detect something that looks like an electron, but you can, it's in a, going in a magnetic field, so you expect it to bend this way. Uh, if it bends the other way, you know it's got the wrong charge. It's got a positive charge on the negative charge, and therefore it must be an anti-electron. But but the subatomic scale, that's really the difference between matter and antimatter. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions for uh, for any of us here as well? Uh, Joel? No, I think there are no more questions in the in the chat. People are answering. Um, I guess I'd like to say uh, on from me a big thank you to uh the team at uh cms uh for uh doing this tour today and of course to bella and the team at i'm a scientist as well uh i've had a good time and i hope the students have too it's a shame they're not on the chat directly uh and as i said if there are any follow-up questions you can post them onto the discussion uh uh chat whatever i'm a scientist call or the, the cern zone the zone that's it oh, okay. post them in the cern zone uh, and uh, myself and the other scientists will be able to answer them. Well, thanks a lot for moderating, Joel. Uh, it was nice meeting everyone. Glad you had a ciao, nice ciao. visit. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.